Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure, uh, it's an honor and it's a privilege to be able to address the topic of health inequalities and the aging workforce at this meeting. Let's see if we can move the slides. Is something okay? Go back here. So it's something with my thumb and this thing. What's why is it? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to take you through health inequalities in Europe very briefly, work and health inequalities, aging and work, sustainable work for aging workers, some key uh, challenges for the workplaces and for policy, conclusions and some suggestions. So health inequalities in Europe are huge. You see them displayed in this graph by member country, and you see the open diamonds of people with a higher educational level, and the one with the full diamonds with a lower educational level. And you see the span here, life expectancy at age 25, country by country. And these uh, differences are uh, constant, as in Southern Europe, or widening, as in Western Europe, North Europe, and Eastern Europe. And that, this has been summarized by one of the uh, uh, major researchers in the field, uh, Johan Mackenbach, as the Nordic paradox, because in the Nordic countries we are supposed to be egalitarian, as the Southern miracle and the Eastern disaster. Let's see. Maybe my other fan will do it better. I don't know what's happening. Now, um, inequalities in health are not only a social issue. Uh, a, a very recent OECD uh, report. Uh, claims that uh, the growing inequalities also affects the productivity growth. The sort of basic uh, point of departure is that there is a risk of a vicious cycle in which individuals with fewer skills and poorer access to opportunities often are confined to operate in low productivity, precarious work, uh, and that this uh, reduces uh, the um, e uh, productivity growth on an aggregate level and widens inequality and ultimately undermines policy effort to in uh, increase productivity and growth. So in summary, they are saying that one should take an inclusive approach to productivity growth and they stress the need to invest in skills. And they also say that supportive, generous welfare systems are good for the development of productivity. Those countries which have these systems are the ones which develop best in productivity. We are seeing overall in the populations of Europe an improvement in health. Uh, that's both an improvement in uh, the self-reported good health and in longevity. But unfortunately, this uh, development is not uniformly go uh, equally good in different groups of a population. You can divide the population by educational level, by income or uh, by uh, deprivation. It all turns out basically the same. In Sweden, we've seen from uh, the 90s to 2014 
a very slow improvement in life expectancy among those with only basic uh, education. And it's the same if we uh, divide by income. It's better for those with upper secondary and with uh, tertiary education, it's remarkably good. And this is also seen in the proportion deceased after 30 uh, years of age uh, by educational level, where you will see, for instance, for the age of uh, 16 women with tertiary education, only 3% had, uh, had di have died while it's about the double with upper secondary and then threefold as compared to, to those with tertiary in those with basic education only. So it's substantial uh, differences and they are there during working age. Uh, the workforce is aging in Europe, as we all know, so that by 2030 it's expected that uh, those aged 55 to 64 will constitute approximately 30% of the workforce in many countries. What does this then mean for the wake workplace? I would say that it means that the workplaces will face increasing diversity for workers of the same age. It's a real challenge. We, we have an overall increase in life expectancy and in health. This allows more productive years and this obviously has to be used. But we also have an increase in diversity with increasing age. We all grow a bit more different with age, which is, is not a bad thing, but we get, get more diverse also with regard to our health status. We acquire more chronic disease as we get older. The good thing is that, is that treatments have improved, so we survive better, and more of us can go back to work with a chronic disease. But this means that a higher proportion of the workforce uh, at the workplace will work with a chronic disease as compared to before, because treatment has improved and because we get older uh, in the workforce. So, and also diversity will increase with growing social divide in health. So the age, aging workforce will be more diverse and this is something the workplaces have to cope with. So what is then the interplay between work and health? Well, the, the first message is that work is good for health. Unemployment is definitely bad for health and it's not just during the period when you are unemployed. But there is something which is called scarring, which means that it's a remaining uh, effect uh, on health with regard to mortality, with regard to both mental and physical health, and it's called scarring. scarring. And there are several pathways, in uh, including less gain of income and resources, less protection, impact on self-esteem and on lifestyle. And there is a, a recent study from the Netherlands which looked at the effect on self-rated health and reported quality of life if you were unemployed and then came into employment. And it's a dramatic effect. And there is even an effect of every month you are employed. It will tend to improve especially your uh, quality of life. But the other side of the coin is then that some working conditions have a substantial contribution to health inequalities in the population. If you look first at gender inequalities, the psychosocial uh, uh, co working conditions are very important. And the Swedish Commission on Inequalities in Health or Equity in Health uh, puts that as a major factor for the gender divide. For instance, in sick leave, and there is an important thing which has happened, which is loose of, uh, of job control in, in the public sector, the uh, caring sector. But there is no evidence for higher risk in women than in men, given the same uh, working conditions. When it comes to the social inequalities in health, the physical uh, workload 
is the major thing which came, comes out, followed by other physical factors, and when it comes to mortality, dangerous uh, substances. And just to give some, some data, in Denmark, self-reported health differences between different uh, socioeconomic groups could to 34%, one-third, be attributed to physical workload, while lifestyle was responsible for about half of that, 17%. In uh, Europe, the European Working Conditions Survey, um, physical workload explained 50% of the difference in self-reported health between white-collar and blue-collar workers. And in uh, Norway's sick leave, uh, differences between psychosocial groups was uh, mainly uh, explained by physical workload, but also psychosocial factors in total about one-third to one-half. The next thing I would like to uh, put your attention to is that working conditions also affect the possibilities to return to work in a sustainable way. And that's especially if you have a physically demanding work because chronic disease generally affects uh, your physical performance more than your cognitive performance. So it's... Um, more often that the de your work demands will exceed your capability if you, if you have uh, a decreased physical performance. And it was, may also affect your productivity and therefore your possibility to keep the job. Many, many manual workers also have lo low job control, which means they have less opportunity for self-pacing and less opportunity to perform the tasks in the way which suits their cap capability. So it means that um, they have less uh, possibilities to adapt to, the, to their individual needs themselves and are more dependent of others. So they, you lose part of your autonomy. Um, now, what about work and aging? This presentation is in the context of the aging population. Well, as we age, we, we become different. Not better, not worse. We are a bit slower. We are not as physically strong. But on the other hand, we are more experienced and it's easier for us to say what's a minor thing, and what's a, main, a major thing. So this sort of levels off to us being as good uh, at performing, but being different. And this has to be uh, taken uh, into account at the workplace. We need um, increased time for recovery and we have more chronic disease as we age. Those are the individual factors, but there are also structural factors which makes the aging worker more vulnerable. That, that is that in general, uh, my generation has a shorter uh, educa education as compared to people who are younger. So we have less formal skills on average Discrimination is also a factor, age discrimination, so that when an older worker applies for a new job, the chance to get it would be lower than for a younger person. And there is this issue of, of again, of, of the physical demands, uh, which seem to have a cumulative effect, uh, at least in, in the study from the US. going to pass this. Um, I would also like to stress uh, uh, that chronic disease is critical when it comes to the work participation of uh, unskilled workers. And this is uh, unpublished data, uh, which has been provided for this presentation by Alex Burdoff of the uh, Erasmus Medical Center in Netherlands, based on the a survey on income and living conditions in Europe from 26 countries. So the blue um, full line here is people with high education. The dotted line is with uh, high education and chronic disease. And you see that the difference 
in la labor uh, market participation is around 8% if you have or have not a chronic disease by higher education. On the other hand, if you have a short education, this gap is much wider, it's 26%. So the possibility to maintain the job with uh, a chronic disease is a critical point for unskilled workers. Um, this, I've, I'm trying to now paint a, a, a picture of, on the one hand, the health disparities which increase the risk for chronic disease if you have short education, low socioeconomic status. On the other hand, um, workplaces which may be problematic in relation to your capacity if you have chronic disease. Then we have the occupational health services which we try to tend to turn to in order to match the work to the capacity of the individual worker, but also to act on reducing uh, risks at uh, the workplace as a primary preemptive measure. What we've seen in Sweden is that there is an increasing mismatch between the um, infrastructure for OSH as exemplified by the access to occupational health services and uh, the need. So this is uh, the self-reported access to occupational health service in 2011 to 2013 as compared to 10 years earlier. And you can see then for unskilled manual workers, it's around 50%. It's fallen a lot uh, from uh, the turn of the millennium. Uh, and it's lower than for the overall workforce. So, uh, um, in the, the light of this, I would say that um, a key challenge is the differential impact of extending working life. And for a starting point, we have a Swedish statistics on um, surviving in work, that is remain at work until age 65 in the most common occupations in Sweden from 2007 to 2010. We have here two sort of clusters, one with managers and professionals remaining uh, on average uh, 80 to 80 percent uh, up to age 65, which is the traditional retirement age in Sweden. Uh, and another cluster of unskilled laborers where only 40 percent remain uh, until age 65. And in many countries now, there are uh, rather strong uh, economic incentives to prolong working lives. But working conditions are not uh, improved uh, in, to a simultaneous extent. And um, excessive work demands or insufficient recovery may make timely retirement health preserving. Uh, so this means that we may end up in a situation where changes in retirement benefits could prevent workers with small economic resources from retiring when it would have been better for their health to do so. And if that case, it could increase both the social and uh, gender inequalities in health, as suggested by uh, Alex Burdoff uh, in an uh, editorial in one of the major occupational medicine uh, journals. Uh, a study from Finland has uh, found that well-being at end of working life is a determinant for later frailty. And we know that frailty in high age is one of the things which is really uh, driving uh, societal costs for the uh, demographic shift towards an aging population. So this, if uh, this is true also for other countries, it would mean that it could actually be costly for society to imply uh, those uh, policies if working conditions are not sim simultaneously improved 
as we uh, put forward economic incentives to prolong working life. Um, my colleague Hans Martin Hasselon uh, from the University of Wuppertal in Germany has also put forward the uh, concept of what is fair retirement age because of the fact that survival, for instance, in relation to your average percentage uh, of uh, the income in the country is related to your life expectancy. So that for uh, higher incomes, you have a longer life expectancy. And uh, the number of years you then uh, have to work for one year for one year of retirement would then vary uh, both between men and women and be between uh, different incomes. And if you then increase uh, the retirement age, this will uh, increase the number of years. Uh, for instance, a uh, low um, uh, income worker has to wor work for one age or a year of retirement. So in conclusions, Employment working conditions and the work environment are major determinants of social and gender inequalities in health. Oh. Uh, good and sustainable work can reduce disadvantages in vulnerable groups and make them less vulnerable. Good work regenerating skills will increase productivity. Physical workload and recovery should be reconsidered given the aging workforce. Increasing job control is likely to enhance self-managed job adaptation. Welfare systems and labor market policies, such as protection during career changes and skills upgrade, interact with occupational safety and health. And economic pressure to prolong working life is likely to increase health disparities and pressure on workplace adapt adaptations unless they are matched by career shifting and skills upgrade possibilities. And this would then end up in some key challenges for workplaces where there is shortage of skilled workers, which is very evident in many countries now increasing diversity and in health, but uh, where age-conscious risk assessment and proactive risk management could be a solution, just as skills development and task and career shifting. And there are two publications here that I would like to highlight, which may assist. And at the policy level, um, I would like to stress that when we have increasing diversity, both in working conditions and in health. The averages may make less sense. We have to look at what's happening and the end of the distributions, and especially with those workers uh, who have more vulnerable positions. We need to protect and develop the occupational safety and health infrastructure, and I come back to that. We need valid assessment of the burden of occupational disease. The right to work and the upgrade of skills is very crucial in the very rapidly changing work, world of work. And equity in health as a perspective should be implemented in welfare and retirement reforms. And it's necessary to account for the much larger difficulties low educated workers have when they have a chronic uh, willness, uh, illness with regard to remaining employed. So implications for policy, as I see it, could be divided into one part, which is to uh, use evidence in an efficient way. And I think it's necessary to align policies between quite different sectors. And I've understood that's usually very difficult, but I, I think that now is a good time because sustainable work is high on the agenda of several policies which are relevant. The other thing is I think that OSH policies need to be more cohesive and I think there are several 
uh, good examples of that, such as in Denmark involving the social partners in uh, benchmarking and also uh, the um, health and safety executive paying much emphasis on getting valid data to assess um, the burden of disease. But I also think that we need to strengthen the OSH infrastructure substantially, both with regard to access to occupational health services, but also to update regulations, uh, for instance, the occupational exposure limits, and keep the scientific expert institutions we have on a national and European level, and the dialogue with the social partners. Uh, and I think also that there are distinctive research needs which emerge and should have a place in the next framework program, especially when uh, looking at the sustainable development goals, but decent work and economic growth is the one which is in the focus for us, but there are several others which interact with this and this need to be taken into account in the uh, research we are doing uh, for the next decade. We should have not only a business case, but also a case on the effect on health and productivity uh, on work for the new systems. Thank you. Thank you. Just wait a moment. A moment. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for your understanding because we were running a little bit over time. So uh, now what we're going to do is we are going to have a coffee break. And uh, after that, when we come back to have the panel, you can be thinking about your questions for Professor Albin and indeed for all of the other uh, panelists who are the exciting panelists who are going to be here later.